Good afternoon and welcome to Bistax Asian Midday Market Watch. Our guest today is Vishnu Bharadan, Head of Economics and Strategy at Mizuho Bank, coming out of Singapore. Uh, Vishnu, good to have you on the show uh, just after Chinese New Year. Always good to be on the show, uh, Brian, and uh, happy uh, Year of the Tiger. Well, I hope that the Year of the Tiger, tiger will be a very good year. We've, for some of us, uh, uh, the, the last two years have not been the most pleasant. For some people, it's been boom time, Charlie, of course, especially in the technology and healthcare sectors. Uh, but we hope that globally, uh, growth will resume, uh, uh, you know, as me being the optimist, all things considered. But before we start, let's take a look at how the crypto markets are performing. Um, Bitcoin is at 36,856. It's down 4.143%. Ethereum is at 2,656. It's down 3.79%. Now, if we move over to regional stock markets, regional stock markets are doing well, starting with the STI, which is at uh, 3,317.05. It's up a whopping 2.08%. Uh, the KLSE is at 1,512.27. Uh, it's unchanged. Uh, Shanghai is closed today. The ASX 200 is at 7,375.6. It's down 0.32%. The Nikkei is at 27,239. It's down 1.07%. The Hang Seng is closed today. And the Kospi is up 2.12% at 2,719.67. So Vishnu, the Kospi and the STI are uh, having a bumper day today. Why is that? Well, I mean, we have seen uh, U.S. equities uh, having a good run, uh, even when uh, Asia markets were away for Chinese New Year holidays. So there has been a bit of a knee jerk, uh, you know, follow, following the optimism in the U.S. Uh, the backdrop of, of this, of course, being uh, some comments out of the Fed suggesting that they may not be quite as brutal as feared uh, when it comes to hiking rates. And we also, uh, in, to a lesser extent, uh, I think anticipating uh, China's stimulus to come through uh, a little bit more emphatically as we cross this year. Uh, markets are, are perhaps, for, for those reasons, uh, buying back on the what we saw, and, and this is more important, the broader context of the, the year opening with a bit of a dip and a sell-off. Uh, so this, this is really where we are reassessing, uh, and there's some caution due at this point of time, I suppose. Now, Vishnu, could you highlight some of the key points that you mentioned during your commentary today? Um, key thing around central banks and also around oil markets. Sure. Um, so, you know, from, from our point of view, uh, the, the ongoing and, and the live game to watch, so to speak, is how and, 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 and what pace central banks are reacting to inflation. So we've seen the Fed becoming increasingly hawkish in its stake. Uh, that has been dampened at the margin slightly by exactly what the Fed said, uh, as well as uh, some of the incoming data suggesting some weakness in jobs, uh, al although, of course, the fear is that it's easier to shrug off uh, weak jobs than it is to shrug off inflation from where the Fed stands. Now, we've got two starkly opposed central banks uh, in, in Europe uh, today going into the meeting. You've got the UK. So the Bank of England is, uh, you know, is going to do a, a rate hike. So a rate tightening is, I, I think, uh, you know, foregone conclusion. Some of the more hawkish margins bets are going for a 50 basis point hike, which is why perhaps sterling has been better supported over the last few days. That, I think, remains the marginal bet. Uh, yes, there are concerns. Yes, UK will have to deal with more wage inflation uh, due to the Brexit issues as well as uh, COVID. But I think the economy is not in a state at which the Bank of England will want to hike by so much. So our base case is 25 basis point. But if you get the 50, uh, the knee-jerk reaction is for sterling strength. And perhaps... Um, a little bit of a downcast weather in, in, in uh, uh, UK equities if the rhetoric is, is not one of uh, you know un, uh, unbridled optimism. ECB is going to be a very interesting one because the ECB has continued to be the stubborn dove, so to speak. Uh, we've had high inflation. Inflation exceeded expectations. Instead of decelerating, which was the expectation going down from 5 to 4%, it climbed a little above 5%, even though the core did soften, but not as much as expected. The real question here is, will the ECB, led by uh, President Lagarde, now concede that inflation is a problem? It, it doesn't look very uh, likely that she's going to do an about turn, uh, and it's more likely that she's going to stick with the mostly temporary factors.
but the marginal shift in thinking around ECB as to when they may start their tightening process uh, could also see the euro being supported better. So the shift in between the European central banks and, and across the Atlantic with the Fed, that's an interesting one to watch because it's got a huge sway on what happens to the dollar. The dollar will be very bullish if uh, both the Bank of England disappoint on rate hikes uh, or rather they, 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 they augur it with uh, statements that are quite defensive and, and, and uh, you know, uh, very careful about growth. And if the ECB continues to stick with this dovish shot, but if the inflation fears come up, then of course these currencies could change the, the, the tide of the dollar, which has got very huge bearing on how uh, emerging Asia currencies perform because the dollar's broad uh, brush is, uh, is, is really set uh, by uh, how the euro does in particular. Uh, against the dollar. So that's, that's one. Uh, of course, the other aspect of this is, as you mentioned, oil. In a parallel universe, oil continues to be high and sticky, adding to inflation worries, adding to worries that it may take some steam off growth. Um, and this is despite the fact that the OPEC plus has continued to stick with its uh, restoration of output uh, to, uh, uh, to, to the tune of 400,000 barrels per day. So they, they've continued to restore. By March, they would have restored 75% of the 10 million barrels per day cut that they made in May last year. Along that trajectory, they should actually restore all of the output by Q4. In theory, this should knock oil prices back because you're saying that supply comes back on and there's some case for inventory building, but that has not happened. So I think this is really uh, reflecting the realities on the ground where A, Demand doesn't seem to be set back by Omicron, so it's harder for prices to take a, a bit of a pullback uh, because they're looking at supply more acutely. Uh, B, even though in theory and on paper it's being restored, this output is being restored, in reality it's not. The smaller OPEC and non-OPEC producers as well are struggling to meet their quota, so they're not fulfilling it. The only guys with spare capacity who can fulfill this are Saudi and UAE, but both have not come forward to say they'll plug the gaps. And there's, uh, of course, the political aspect of it where they cannot be seen, uh, you know, taking over Russia's market share in the, in, in the situation where Russia doesn't look like it can pump up a lot more when the slightly over 10 million barrels is pumping. So it does look like supply is going to be sticky because of the undershoot here. Uh, and the final factor, of course, Ukraine is, uh, you know, hanging over as an issue. And these types of geopolitical risks tend to shore up oil prices because they're not looking at the supply coming out today, but they're looking at the potential for supply disruption. So for these factors, oil remains high and sticky, which means that the central banks are going to have an even harder time as they navigate between uh, the cost push inflation and signs of fraying growth, as we've seen with the slightly softer jobs numbers in the US, as well as uh, lower savings rates, so on and so forth. Now, um, Vishnu, I want to uh, zoom in on this. the expected slightly softer jobs numbers. Tomorrow is uh, non-farm payrolls. Um, what's what's the, the general consensus? How soft is soft? Well, I, I think now the initial forecast for looking at between 120 to 150,000 jobs created has been knocked back, given that the ADP has shown jobs lost, not created. So there's even a directional shift in thinking. Um, and the thing, thing here is that typically ADP and, and non-farm payrolls haven't had a very great correlation. So I wouldn't be surprised if the jobs expectations for the non-farm payroll is still in the ballpark of say, uh, 60 to 80,000 jobs being created at least. But as we discussed earlier, uh, here's the thing. Uh, I, I think the, the jobs, even if it's disappointed, markets will shrug it off as an Omicron disruption and not a loss of the job creation capability of the economy. So they're going to make that a huge discerning factor, in which case it's going to be a much higher bar for the Fed to, to, to be knocked off course from their March rate hike. So I, I think to, to really take that uh, March rate hike off the table is going to be uh, uh, really signs of the job market losing its momentum. And I think this one job number, this is not quite the swallow that's going to bring, uh, you know, that, that, that spring from uh, the Fed's tightening winter. So that's, that's not quite it. Mr. as always, thank you very much for your insights and thank you very much for coming on the show. My pleasure to be here, Brian. Thank you for having me. Now, we've been speaking to Vishnu Varadhan, Head of Economics and Strategy uh, from Izuho Bank on Bistax Asian Midday Market Watch. I'm Brian Fernandez. Please check out this video and podcast on our various platforms, as well as our website, www.bistax.asia. 
please uh, subscribe and like our various platforms. Thanks for tuning in.